We're at Chuck's Speed Shop in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We're getting a little bit of help on the 39 Zephyr here. Trying to uh, make, make sure we have everything tuned up right, and I'm going to have JB uh, give you a little uh, conversation with Dave here. We're just talking to Dave, the uh, technician has been given the, the job of trying to figure out what's, uh, what's going on here. We, we, the symptoms of the engine that we are, are working on are that uh, it runs and then it dies, which is um, very frustrating because you got a number of things that could be wrong. We're okay mechanics, but we're not in, in Dave's class. Dave is accustomed to seeing all these interesting different kinds of cars come through here. So he's, and he's familiar with the older stuff. This, this is older technology, but they're newly made. So it makes it even more frustrating in, in some ways for us. But, you know, uh, Ed Smith built the engine, so we know that's sound. But we also know there's a million things that could go wrong. This car has been in construction for a long time. So the, one of the problems with a, a long-winded construction is that things that you were right when you started are now not right again. So, you know, time has passed. And I think Dave is, is suspicious that uh, these carburetors, even though they're new, uh, I think you said that p possibly the, uh, the, the rubber diaphragms in them has just given up. Yeah, part of the reason that the car is so hard to start is because the accelerator pump is not working. And the accelerator pump is in there for two reasons. One, to give an extra shot of gas when you accelerate the car, and but it also primes the carbs in the morning to give you that cold start situation. So what we're getting right now is the accelerator pump doesn't work at all. So essentially to start the car, you have to spray carburetor cleaner down to get it to right. fire up in the morning. So we'll go in there, take the tops off the carburetors, get some accelerator pumps in there. That way we'll get a shot of gas every time we step on the gas. It will be easier to start. And then we'll deal with the other issues that arise as we... Yeah, that just gets them. the engine running. Yep. So the idea that these are old and simple is just not true. They still have to work under a lot of different conditions. Acceleration, start up in the morning, uh, running at full speed. The fact that we introduced two new carburetors and built our own manifold complicates it even further. If you just have one carburetor, you only have one thing to go wrong, as one guy likes like right. to say. And that's one of the reasons that uh, Don Roberts is such a big fan of one carburetor. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, the engine needs a little help in the horsepower area, so and it doesn't hurt to look at them either, right. <laughs> to be honest. So, but now we got we got to deal with something the engine was never really designed to handle. But how do you basically go about troubleshooting a, a strange old car? It still works on the same principle of it has to have certain things. It has to have fuel. It has to have spark. It has to have compression. That's true of all motors. And if my situation is always starting off at a base and making sure that it has everything it's supposed to have. If a car is not running, it will be missing one of those things. So it comes down to kind of a puzzle. All right, figure out what it doesn't have, find out why, fix that, and move on. So you still treat, even whether a car is, you know, 70 years old or 20 years old, you still treat it basically the same, that it has to have those basic things to function and you go from there. So go in a certain order on every particular car and follow that order and then you don't miss any steps and everything okay. tends to come to fruition. So can you uh, tell us what you've encountered so far, what you found when you got, when the car came in the door and where you are in your process? When the car came in the door, it would not start and it wouldn't start because it was running so lean. In other words, it had way too much air for the amount of fuel that was going in the car. Plus it has the accelerator pumps, as I mentioned, that were not working, so it wasn't priming the carburetors. So even when I could prime the carburetors and get to run, it was running so lean, it wanted so much more fuel that you had to artificially give it some just to get it to run. In messing around with it, found out that the mixture screws were way too far in and it wanted a lot more fuel so adjusting those on all three carburetors made that start to work. And it, at least now it has an idle, even though the idle is up there at 14, 1500 RPMs, at least now it's capable of running on its own. So that's where I'm at now. I'll fix the accelerator pumps and then I'll look into the linkage to find out why the idle is so high. When you come into Chuck's, they've been around so many years. They have such a clientele and such a following that they have people out there waiting. I mean, we had, we didn't, couldn't get an appointment for two or three weeks. Right. Just you know, just in general, you start out almost a month behind. 
So um, you, you got to be willing to wait for them. And those people that are waiting for this car to be done are still waiting. Yeah. And so Dave's aware of that. He doesn't have to worry about job security. No. His, his job is to get in, find the problem, identify it, fix it properly, and then go on to the next one. Well, it's fantastic to have you uh, working on this, Dave. And Thanks. We'll look forward to seeing this thing running right. Yeah, it's, we'll it's do a cool a, car. We'll do a little follow-up on it when yeah, we get absolutely. that Absolutely. Cool. I've known Dave for 30 years. Yeah, at least that. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. Well, let's make it 30. It's okay, we'll good. go with 30. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, Dave is a tremendous guy, and you've been doing this a long, long time, and doing extremely high level of, of this sort of thing. This is really the probably the hardest thing to do in automotive is diagnose engines and cars that have been meddled with. Right. Stock cars are definable. Sure. And we have a stock car and it has one carburetor and it doesn't have all of this. And it's a lot simpler to figure out. But you know, when you get to graduate level cars, you gotta have a graduate level guy working on it. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, good. good. Thank cool. you, Dave. You bet. Uh, <laughs> I, I, just, I just have to comment on this. Any of you mechanic guys out there, there's there's toolboxes and then there's this okay right i mean this is insanity uh obviously dave's been around a long time but he has uh my my reckoning about 40 of everything and 50 of some and this the reason that he's so effective i think in large part is you don't have to look at brain is that correct right you, i don't I don't need to have to put something away every single time. I can just, everybody's looking for another 10 millimeter. You know, you got, you better, you better have a few of them. And they yeah. disappear. They do. They walk they away. Poof. <laughs> now, I don't know where they go. Some guys got hundreds of them. Okay. But uh, what he's saying is this actually rolls to the car if necessary. And so he, he doesn't you know, go back and forth. He's not wasting that time. It could be work, used, you know, invaluable time actually working on a car. And then there's this. Okay, this, for all you guys at home, we got the toolbox is big, okay, talk to your wife. Okay, we uh, decided to come back after lunch. Some people can actually get something done in that compressed period of time, and Dave happens to be one of those guys, so. Yeah. Um, Dave looks at it this way. If I can fix it with what's already there, then let's do it that way. Why do we want to wait around for a, a carburetor kit to show up when, if we can make this thing happen, Let's try and make it happen. Well, it turns out that when he opened up the carburetor, the diaphragms are, are leather. That's a little bit unusual. Is that true, Dave? It, it's or unusual not? for anything newer, but all the older carburetors would use leather accelerator pumps. Okay, so it's, so it's a thin leather accelerator pump, very long lasting, but it must be kept moist. Moist. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are different kinds of diaphragms and carburetors. Now this old style carburetor, these are new carburetors, remember, but they're built in the old style because of the appearance. So there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. You can put rubber diaphragms in there, you can put leather diaphragms in there. The old carburetors, a lot of them at least, had leather diaphragms, so that could be reconditioned. You gotta remember, most people didn't have access to a garage or a dealership. They had to fix a lot of this stuff themselves. Or in a small setting, a small mechanic shop, he doesn't have all, the, all this access to all this stuff. So. They had to make them in such a way that it could be serviced. And so a lot of them are leather. Leather is commonly available. You could actually replace it if you could get access to the leather, but that's, generally speaking, you just had to soften it up so it would function again. So what we're doing, what, what Dave has done, is once he found out that they were in fact leather, then he realized he could probably, probably being the key word, recondition them and put them back in and it might just function. So that's what we're trying to do here. So he's taking the carb apart to get to the diaphragm. And something just flew off and hit the wall. So that's not a good sign. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> really, it's not needed. It's not. We'll, we'll put a new I, one in I, there. I have a friend who used to build Put a new carbs. one in there anyway. And, and carburetors do come with some extra stuff. Is that, stop me if I'm wrong. But some of it really never comes into play. And I was watching Bill carburetors and he'd be going like this and he'd be going. You <laughs> <laughs> made a big show out of throwing it over your shoulder, you know, and it hit you in the eye or hit the car or something. Right. But it was funny because in a in a in a race carburetor, there are a lot of things that just don't you just don't need. Yeah. So they had to go. And now these are Stromberg 97s. Is that yes. They are reproductions of Stromberg 97s. So here's the leather pump. Here you go. Look. So this pump is made out of leather. 
Okay. okay, so then you take the leather and you can put it in some transmission fluid and swell it up and work the leather a little bit to make it, the diaphragm adhere to the side of the bowl of the carburetor, in right. which case it will push fuel through the right. accelerator yeah, pump ex discharge. I guess it expands the clearance just exactly. enough. Right. It opens just up enough. Just and it's enough. really a small amount, but yeah. it's just yeah. enough to make it either work or not work. So. I'm, I'm curious how you can swell it up that quickly. You haven't even done this one yet, right? No, I haven't done this one, but I've done the other two. Is it a matter of minutes, hours, days? Just what? a few seconds. Can we get some okay. training fluid? Holy cow. Seconds? Good Lord. So you can take some training fluid and swirl that around inside. Okay. Okay. Unbelievable. And then you're going yeah, to that fast. work that in there like it's that. Kind of expand it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just ever so slightly. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Then to test it, I'll put it back inside the well and I'll make it work without the top of the carburetor on there. That to way, see if you have to see if it, and you, it should be able to squirt right down inside. Oh, there. you can actually see it work. Yeah, just, yep, that worked. Ah, so you can actually test the theory yep. right, as, right after he does it, which is really speeds things along. And this is something you can do at home too. If your carburetor um, misbehaves, this is one of the things that you can do. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try this at home, but if you have to, you know, it is a, a possible cure because these carbs are now two years old. They're not new anymore. And they've been sitting around and we didn't, until we got to this point in the bill, we had no real use for them. But these are extremely, would you agree these are well made, Dave? I mean, oh, it's, yeah, it's an excellent carburetor. There we go. So it's working. Okay, so you so feel you some can, friction. If, if you can look straight down inside there where that brass tube is in that Venturi, as I push yep, on this, okay. You okay. can see the gas squirt. Oh, you can actually see yep, it working. You can see it do it. Yep. So as long as that works that way, then I know that when I put the top of the carburetor back on, then the And it'll actually get a little better now. potentially even as it time goes on. Right, it'll be up. a nice smooth stroke. Okay, there. right. I had no idea that's the way they worked. They seem to be. See, so see the friction. Yeah. That means it's it's got grabbing there. the wall, creating a seal. So when it comes down, it can actually push the gas. Otherwise, the gas goes around it, and it doesn't, it doesn't push the gas. That's one of the reasons, one of the things that was a symptom of what we were seeing happening, but we couldn't figure out why. Mm -hmm. You hit the gas and run, but then as soon as you got on the gas, it, it starved it because these, these pumps were, were actually not functioning properly. So most people would have replaced the entire carburetor. And, and you know, yeah, I would have fixed it. <laughs> right? Yeah, Except that the carburetors are a lot of money. Yeah, by the way, and all that's failing is that one little part of it. It right. took us six months to get the third part carburetor. Right. We got two and we couldn't get the third one. And we, we insisted on having three. And I remember distinctly. It took forever to get it. And so now that brings up the question. Now that we have a documented, documented illustration of how to do this, Mm -hmm. This can be part of the history of that car and any other car with this setup, which we have two or three of. And then they can say, oh, if this is doing this, then maybe I can just take the top off or have somebody, the, please uh, don't try this at home. <laughs> right. It's really, uh, you, it, it looks easy. And you were asking about why I took that clip out and just did that with it. Right. Because I know, I knew that they're, those are very small cotter pins and once you undo them, they're not generally yeah. reusable. So, so you if you use a thing like a Jesus clip right here, okay. oh, that can be you. taken in and, out, in and out a whole bunch of times That's, and yeah. you don't go searching. So in this is box. probably spring steel yeah. mm -hmm. and it's not gonna just fall apart. Snap right inside there and then I can take that in and out as many times as I want and right. not have to go searching for it. Very important distinction because that wouldn't even work. Right, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll get work that through, back through the hole again. Right, right. okay, cool. Okay. So the trick with these, the most careful part is when you're putting the accelerator pump in. Line everything up. You don't want to rip it. Because once you rip the leather oh, accelerator yeah, pump, it's very, then it's, use, it's very useless after that. Yeah, it's fragile. Well, don't hurry on our account. Just... Hey, don't hurry. Oh, I'm right. not hurry. At the same time, you still got to try to work with it while it's still help moist. It, help it start. Okay. So Would generally, you say this is one of the reasons to drive your car every so often? Absolutely. Keep absolutely. fuel up there. Fuel and, and driving a car keeps this stuff 
fresh and, and lubricated and, and keeps these sort of things from happening. They like to be driven. You're not preserving a car by never driving it, are you? No, I it's just, actually, just it's the opposite. It's hurting it. Yeah. it that, you know, gasoline is not forever. And we use uh, Sunoco racing fuel because it doesn't have any alcohol in it. So it tends not to give up in, what would you say, two or three years probably? Minimum of a year for sure. I've yeah. seen cars that only get, for um, when sand buggy is really popular and they right. only go out in the summer type of deal. Right. They if they would year. keep it over the winter, they wouldn't use them. But if you'd keep race, Sunoco in it all the time, you'd go in the next season, car would fire right up and you weren't paying me to rebuild your carburetor again. Yeah, exactly. So it's, everybody complains about the price of the fuel. But what's cheaper? You pay me to rebuild your carburetor or spend yeah. a few bucks more on fuel? Yeah, and it's frustrating too because oh, sure. that's why cars don't get driven. Right. They don't understand how they work and they can't find people to help them understand. That's one of the reasons we do this. So this information is out there and uh, this helps people do this either yourself or you can go to a mechanic and say, here, here's what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, try this. Wholesale replacement is expensive. And doesn't happen a lot, and that's 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 not a good thing. Mm -hmm. It disables the car potentially. It's probably the weakest part of the system. Everything else is happy almost all the time. Is that true, Dave? I mean, the the engine itself. This is true. The engines yeah. can sit for years with oil in and keep the lubrication inside them. Right. And it's not going to turn south on you. Whereas fuel is it's pretty dirty. So yeah. Unless you're buying race gas, it's, yeah. it's just not going to last. The other thing to do if you're not don't have access to racing fuel is go to um, uh, a gas station that has gasoline that hasn't had alcohol added to it. There are, in any major city, there's usually places you can go that has no ethanol or alcohol in the fuel. So we're about to have proof of concept here. He's going to hook up the linkages and that's see just, what That's happens. just amazing. Like. What we've been doing for three weeks, he just did in about 30 minutes. Uh, that's embarrassing, actually. but. I'm not going to go there. Um, he's supposed to know how to do this, and we're, we're fabricators and builders. But this, this is one of the ways that we remember how to do this stuff properly. And if it does it again, we might know. But if, candidly, if it happens again, I'm coming right back here, okay? I'm not going to mess with it because that may not be the problem. Right. The problem with too little information is you tend to make conclusions based on too little information. Yeah. And now we're going to blame everything on the carburetor. Uh, see, <laughs> this is handy. But that's not the way it works, and Dave knows what we're talking about. There's a lot more to it than that. Is the same thing true of the fuel pumps that are made today for yeah, the it's diaphragms? Still, it's still those? just a rubber diaphragm inside there. They hold up better than accelerator pumps, but I replace pretty much anybody that lets their car sit for right. any length of time. You end up having, a, I mean, if it's a matter of a couple of years, then you end up taking a fuel tank out. A lot of times it kills the sending you in the tank, so then the oh. gas gauge doesn't work anymore. Oh, God. Um, on and on and on. Then it's just a domino effect of right. it. It just ruins the next thing and the next thing. Yeah, so, so, moral of the story, don't keep, put gasoline with ethanol. And if you do, try and, find, try and find some race gas. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know yeah. it's more expensive. Absolutely. But how much is it fixing your car? Just, it's, it's the price of admission. You have to do that. And uh, it's probably on the order of double what a gallon of gas, gasoline is. And if yeah. you do the math, it's really cheap. Yeah. If you want your car to sit for a long period of time and have it start and run when you come around to want to use it again, then just go get a drum and get race gas. Get a dispenser and put it in. So, Dave, tell us what you're doing now putting the, all the linkage back together on the carburetor. All this on this side here works the chokes. So it's got a manual choke on the dash, which is connected to the wire with a long wire that runs through. So when you pull the lever on the dash, all three chokes will close manually, hence the name manual choke, okay. as opposed to an automatic choke, which uses a bimetallic spring that heats up with electricity. So we're putting all this back together. Is it necessary or desirable to have a choke on every single one of those and have it hooked up the way we, we've got it? No, you could definitely just have your main carburetor that feeds your center carburetor. Could be the one with choke and the other two could be open. Would that be better in some way? It's not better or worse. It's just it's not different and it matters of how much you use the manual choke if you use all three because it's 
essentially putting your hand over the top of each carburetor all at the same time with a manual choke as opposed to just doing it with one. Um, it won't run as rich if you only do one. That being said, you just learn how your car works as far as how much you pull that choke out and how quickly you start to push it back in when you warm it up. Okay, that was an eight hour answer to a five second question. Uh, if I can distill that down, I think what he said what he, at the end of the day is that a single choke on a single carburetor, pick the right one because it has less pieces and less chance of misbehaving. Am I, am I correct in saying that you'd be better off just having one of these on a choke, maybe the center one? You can have one. Or does it? It, it just, if you, if you have three, it's three times as much fuel you're putting in when it's cold. Oh, got to be mindful of that. Got to be mindful of that. So then you're finding that you're pulling your, pushing your mechanical choke back in and not using it quite as much. Okay. All right. Or, or for long, if you had all three less length like of time okay. if you're using all three. So it really doesn't matter, but it, it would be, it'd be a, either way, you just have to be mindful of what you're doing. Exactly. you got to know your car, which, how much right. fuel it wants when it's cold. And it'll, it'll be consistent. It, it will tell you pretty quickly. If it starts blubbering when you have the choke pulled all the way out, which is closing the chokes, and you start to push it in and you can hear the RPM start to come up, come up, come up, then you know you've got it over choked. And okay. All right. It, it, Makes it sense. Just, it, it's knowing your car and what it's asking yeah. for. Well, this way we, you know, we're trying to help people understand that a lot. Of, this 3-2 setup doesn't exist anywhere else except in our shop. Um, we built it because we thought it flowed better. The ones that you can buy, I think we talked about this at one time, were really pretty to look at. Uh, but if you turn them over, you look at them, they're just, they're all for looks. An engine has to function. It doesn't care how pretty the intake manifold is. And so what we were trying to do is get something that would dis dis disperse the, the fuel mixture equally over the engine. That typically is better than having it all dump in one area on top of the mm -hmm. engine. So that, that, this is a long engine, so if it goes in the middle, it's got to go clear up to here. Yeah, the fuel right. you're talking about. Exactly, exactly. So <clears throat> it, it just reason that if you have a, a carburetor here, uh, it's closer to this cylinder than this one would be. So if, if mm -hmm. we take these other two out, then that gasoline has to travel all that way. But that means that these, if you're going to put three carburetors on there, they have to be synchronized one to the other properly, mm -hmm. or they can do ju just the opposite. They can over, over, overwhelm it with a fuel g gas mixture. So in other words, you don't want to flood it. You want Correct. It. You want it to come online uh, progressively, is the expression. So that in the and then when the engine's going at low low speed, you want to put in, let's say, two units of fuel. You don't want to dump four more units on top of that just because you're going five miles an hour faster. If that makes sense. You want a smooth transition between less fuel and more fuel, not a big dump at one at one stage. Is that true, Dave? I mean, Correct. is it pretty much true? Yeah. Okay. Over, because if you overfuel it when it's cold, very quickly you're going to find out the plugs are all going to turn very black and sooty. Right, which means that then they don't fire a, properly. And you're going to get a misfire out of that because the plugs don't fire right. well. Right. A lot of this stuff is taken up in automatic choking equipment in modern cars. We don't have that benefit, so we got to live with that. And we got to kind of design the system a little differently. Uh, so that it, it functions in a variety of settings. One is start up, it could be really cold. Mm -hmm. When an engine's running, it's running hot. That's a totally different thing. So Dave, for people who have never set up a multi-carb setup before, uh, what, what, what do you have to think about when you're connecting these all up? Synchronicity. Every, they, all three carburetors have to do the same thing at the same time. The throttle plates have to always start off at a closed position, all three of them, and then do the same thing. If you're asking all three carburetors to work at the same time, they all three have to work exactly together for it to flow, feed each cylinder evenly. So that's whether it's air, whether it's choke, whether it's throttle. Exactly. But that's evolving as you put on the throttle. And as all of them open up, that's, there's a, an evolution going on there. So when it's at idle, it doesn't need a lot of fuel. Right. Once it starts moving, it can accept more fuel. One of the problems you get into is if you dump a lot of fuel, too much fuel and air on an engine, it'll, it'll actually gag because it can't ingest all of that. Correct. So it's got to come online as the need requires it and in a progressive way. Right here. 
but we should be able to run at a base idle right now after we hook our fuel line up, and then we'll worry about our linkage okay. to make all three work at the after same that time happens. after we know that all three are doing okay. what they're supposed to. Did they tell you how to start this thing? Yes. I said, but thing. I had to kind of sort of, and then I had to figure yeah, it out. Yeah, it's a little, little it's bit. It's a little different, uh, but. Yeah. We call it an anti theft device. It, yeah, <laughs> right. Your own little alarm system. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Now, you were concerned about something being sticky. As I recall, the, either the throttle linkage. The, throttle, the throttles were sticky, and that's the idle. Once I got it to run, the idle was hanging up about 1,500 RPMs and wouldn't go any lower than that. Okay. So, so we want to try to get that. Oh, yeah, that that'll be the next thing I deal with once okay. I know the carburetors are capable of putting fuel in it. Okay. The guy you talked to, Dave, is the one that made all of the linkage in the fuel log for it. He's the one that actually gave me the heads up about yep. um, if you're going to pull the carburetors off, pull the whole um, fuel system as one unit as opposed to trying right. to squeeze it out, yep. which I've run into before, but it was nice to have the heads up about it. So. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's homemade. If you, I, try to, homemade. if you try to squeeze one out, then what happens? The line bends, and then when you go to put it back you in, can't. it's not going to fly, it, yeah, and it's, it's going to leak. Work. So it, it, it makes more sense to take the extra two minutes to pull it all off as a unit sure. as opposed to trying to cheat it out. i got to tell you, there were some uh, reservations to the guy that built it and tuned it originally because it ran fine but before. So now we bring in a new doctor, and he's, he's a little bit on the edge about that. Well, I and can I, see where he just doesn't want to have anything that he's done get with. compromised yeah. and i i totally understand that see that's that's the difference between a good mechanic and one that's got self-issues okay uh, I, w I wouldn't go that far no I <laughs> well I mean, know, he's, he's all... clearly very talented no he is he really is and i think initially he was a little bit standoffish about this whole thing and then i said you know what we've run the gambit we, we cannot we need a fresh set of eyes. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And um, that's all there is to it. But he's a very prideful guy. He's very talented. And I think he, it was like, you know, a doctor redoing his operation or something. But he got over it. He, he, wants, was, he was perfectly fine with me on the phone and very helpful. That's because you were understanding of the situation, Dave. And the way you talked to him was not demeaning. I mean, no. you don't talk to that guy demeaning. No, he's, I don't, he, want, don't do that to anybody. Yeah, there's very few people on his level. Any, and anybody that can have the kind of talent oh, that yeah. can build something like this, you have to respect them. Yeah, so. exactly. Well, even, that's, even if there's an area that they don't shine in, right. that doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't. You don't need to, you know, go against a man's pride. That's right. just stupid. But some people don't understand that. Boy, it is tricky, isn't it? See how he's got to snug that up to the carbon. Then mm -hmm. I didn't realize he had to go through all that. See what I mean? Snug it up with one and tighten the other. Yeah. Otherwise, it'll seep out of here. Yeah. This will be tight, but it'll leak there. And there's no there's no forgiveness in the in the in the fuel. Uh, you know, it's to be a little gentle. See, this is all hand fabricated to be perfectly the right now, distance. Are those brass fittings? Because there's just a little bit of give in brass. Is that what happens there? Or, uh, know? It does. It crushes easier. Yeah. Without yeah, a and doubt, it creates um, its own and, seal. And it, it goes up against the seat very easily. But it also, if you over tighten it, then it's also prone to yeah, leaking. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so you got to. It's got to be a really good touch. You work within the material. Yeah, but it's, it takes some talent to do this. What we're watching right now doesn't happen, you know, on a video. This is just an instinct and a lot of, a lot of hours, a lot of custom systems that they either designed or had to, had to fix. And uh, I think probably doing this kind of post-operative surgery is more difficult than building it in the first place in some ways because mm -hmm. it's already there. You don't know what's right. You don't know what's wrong. So you kind of have to take it a little bit at a time, and sometimes the guy who did it was really talented. Some guy, eh, not so much. Well, like Dave said earlier, he has to start off figuring out what is working, so he has a baseline Exactly, to work but sometimes with. he hasn't got much to work with. We're really fortunate that, uh, that this was reasonably well done, and mm -hmm. the, the real problem was it just sat around for a long time. The seals Turns went, one of the, the problems. Waiting That's for the interior or whatever we're yes, waiting for. Yes, exactly. Different parts. Waiting for one of the other prima donnas that works at our place. <laughs> yes. They were at a ballet in Paris, I think, when this was supposed to be. But, uh, yeah. It's amazing. Um, 
how many really talented people we do have there. But sometimes when they go, you know, we can't we can't sit on our hands when a part's not there. We have to go do something else. There's been a lot of that lately, and it's pretty frustrating. It is. It is. Oh my goodness! Over since COVID, how long you have to oh, wait to get geez. parts? Some of the stuff. I hate to not, blame everything on COVID. You can't. You should. Well, but just, but our system isn't working like it. No, it's broken. It's not. Okay. It really screwed up a lot of things. What we've done with this customer is we have decided that we're going to have spare things that we were concerned we either should be in it or, uh, for instance, we, we may be difficult to source <laughs> later. So, I that mean, are sense. there some things here that you can see, I mean, uh, carb kits or anything of that nature that, that we might want to be thinking about, put it in a trunk and it's there when he needs it a year and a half from here or potentially? Um, I said a, a set of carb kits are not a bad idea. Okay. Um, as long as they stay sealed, if you unseal them and the air gets to the accelerator pump, like we were talking about, yeah. it doesn't. It won't last. Right. Okay. So don't open that bag until. No. It's exactly. Like we have an extra distributor. We have an extra coil. That's all good stuff to have. Yeah. Set of plug wires. You know. Yeah. Stuff that they're going to have difficult time finding. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, one of the reasons that they. They, you, these motors are disappearing is because people are concerned they can't, they can't find the parts for it. So what we want to do is at least give uh, a fair amount of those parts and in, in, in send it out with the car when it goes so he's not out looking for that. See what that does. See what happens, right? Yeah. He's good. Breathe. <laughs> I just noticed there was air bubbles in the in the filter for the fuel pump. Yeah, that. Where was that coming from? Just the, because we took it apart, in or here? Yeah, there was bubbles in there initially. Sure, as it as the fuel pump pushes it in there, it's okay. going to. It's going to purge the it's air. It's going. It's it's like percolating. The coffee is percolating type of deal. Okay. You'll see that in there, and it'll. As Does it, it do it every up, time? You because think? it's taking it out of here. Okay. And you're adding all the time, so it's creating this vacuum all the time with the fuel pump, and when it does that, it'll create. Some oh, air so it'll keep doing it. it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. It's not, it's not it is concern. a sign of a good fuel pump, though, because that, that glass bowl is staying very full. Okay. So if you get one that's kind of on the ragged edge, that means that it'll, it'll be about halfway level, and then you'll see a whole lot of bubbles, and then that tells you that's that it's good. working really hard, but it's not doing it. And it's starving the engine exactly. for gas. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to hook up, a, put some things in the exhaust pipe so we don't choke everybody out, and then we'll start looking at how rich or lean the car is running. Okay. So we're going to have to turn that back on because that makes noise. Okay, no problem. And we'll see what we got. I'm going to double check, make sure everything's tight. You did a nice job building this linkage. It's nice. Yeah, that's it's really beautifully made. We took a, about three different kinds and took them all apart, took raw parts off of them, and then built it back that's in. Nice. That's a good way to do it. Yeah, I like it's, that. it's really clean. I'm really tickled with it. Damn. Look at this. That's cool. Wow. Yeah. And it pumps all the exhaust, gets pumped outside the building instead of choking people out inside the building. So it works well. We can build one of these. Very good. They're not complicated. We got our, our radar air vacuum for you know getting gas out of the tanks
Was that the was that the uh, gear hitting something? Because I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. It's the starter disengaging with the flywheel. That doesn't sound good. It, it could be how sensitive I push that button because we're engaging it, and then as soon as I let off the button, it's disengaging. So okay. if I hold that button on a second too long, so it's applying. Moral of the story is hit it and let it hit it and let it go. The nice part is this now that it's carburetors are working, it starts so easily right. that you don't be have able to turn grinding right. 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 Yes, I'm trying to get them all to, the idle's much higher than I want it to be, yes. so I'm trying to find out why, what happened. And when I was talking to Mark earlier, he says, yeah, it's kind of all over the place and trying to figure out the angle of these is off of trying to understand what was happening. Yeah, here. we can't have it idling that high.
still idling too fast, huh? Yeah, I'm trying to. Wonder why it doesn't react. It had. It's certainly something to do with the linkage. I'm trying to. Well, look, we got to redo the linkage. We got to do the redo the linkage. Well, I'm trying to see if there's We're a not simple perfect. answer. Far. Sir. I said the linkage. We made the linkage, so we may have to remake it because sure. it doesn't allow it to idle down. Is that a possibility, David? It's just. It's a possibility, but. Um, Can you just cut it loose? And oh, I have no trouble getting it off. I'm just trying to make what we have work. And yeah, I'm, I understand. So if we need a longer rod, we'll just go get a longer rod. That's what's going on. I'm not sure. It yet. runs really well, but it's, it, we can't get it to idle down. There's something to do with this kind of over here. Okay, so if we take this out of the equation. Have you ever encountered three carburetors being kind of too much because there's three of them? No, yeah. 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 And the more common thing is when people put uh, two four barrels on, that, oh, that's yeah. very common. They'll put a high rise intake or a small blower on it and then they'll put three, you know, 600 CFM carburetors on there, or two CFM, 600 CFM carburetors. And you got, at wide Way. open throttle, you got 1200 CFM. Most motors don't need that. And so you'll find a car that's fouling out the spark plugs all the time, doesn't want to restart when it's hot. Very common. Um, it's much, over it's a much happier, exactly. It's a much yeah. happier engine if you're in the 350 to 500 CFM range per carburetor at the most, as opposed yeah. to two 600 or 750s. There is such a thing as just right. It's there is, well, absolutely. And, and you can over carburetor it. You can over carburetor it very easily. Yes. You kill the performance, not add to it. Right. That's, it's, more is not always better. It's, it's a balancing act, Exactly. Right? Yes. And you want to come on early, it needs to be very small. Okay, so if we you want to build down, as okay. as the work? need comes to, but you don't want it to dump in there. That was Don Roberts' uh, favorite theory: was that too many carburetors is is what kills the bottom end performance of a lot of cars. You open that whole thing up, dumps all that air in there, and all my gas, the engine can't can't deal with it, can't manage it. Plus, then it dilutes the oil. I've I've seen many cars that are over carbureted. And as soon as you oh God, yeah. pull the drain plug out, gasoline's running out of the oil pan, which has a whole lot of other oh issues. It oh washes God, out yeah. the bearings. Yeah, um, it ruins, it can ruin the engine. It can yeah. ruin a motor just by being over carbureted, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so if we do that. Some people resort to shutting down a carburetor. Because after all, we're, in some ways, we're more interested in the look. And it becomes a well, cosmetic. Thing. You can you can do it a lot of different ways. I'm not going to presume to know as much as Dave does, but some of them just run on the center carburetor, yeah. mm -hmm. and the other two are for show, and that's fine in some circumstances. If you can make them work, then we'd like to see them work. If they can, if they don't, they're not adding anything. Then they may have to be either mitigated or shut down entirely. We're going to make the operation of the car the most important thing, not performance. This is not a hot rod. We're not trying to lift the front wheels off the ground. We want it to work and work consistently. Can we shut down one of the carburetors to take it offline to see if it helps, or is that even a... And that's kind of what I was doing when I was taking the linkage off. Okay. Um, as soon as I loosen this and you accelerate it, if right. the rod is not tight, it doesn't pull the throttle. I got you. So what I'm seeing with this front carburetor is the linkage is up, the throttle arm was upside down, so it was pulling against it. Ah. Um, and so instead of everything being linear like this, it was going through the first two carburetors, and then when it hurt, hit the front carburetor, it went down at an angle like this. Gotcha. I'm going to see if that helps us any or not. Fire. Clear. See, as soon as I just touch that button, as long as I'm not holding it in, then it starts then you're not hearing that noise. So it's kind of like on a regular car if you were taking the thing right. and holding the key over. The button just has to be real touchy.
higher than I want. Is a solution to a high idle putting smaller jets in there? The size of the jets controls how much fuel is being metered inside the motor. So it doesn't really control the idle per se, it controls the amount of fuel going in. Okay. The idle being high is usually because the throttle plates are being held open for one reason or another. Okay. If you have one carburetor, it's pretty simple. When you have three, you got to figure out which one is not very happy, especially with the linkage not being um, uh, standard standard stuff exactly. All right. So we'll see. If, yep, there we go. It's just a matter of taking each one out of the time out of the picture one at a time. I see. Right. So the way to do it, you got to methodically right. break it down to one at a time to right. work it out. What he's doing now, he's looking at what happens when you engage it. This is an automatic car. Automatics rob horsepower. So whenever you set up the idle, you have to factor that in. You have to get a little bit more idle. So when the in, when you put the thing in reverse or drive, that is going to bog the engine down a bit. So you got to leave some room in there so that it doesn't die. So the idle is going to be a little bit higher with an automatic car because that, that, that automatic transmission is stealing horsepower. That's one of the reasons that racers don't use automatics because they, they take more power than they're really worth. You know what tranny's in here? You know what transmission's in it? It's a C4. Does the motor got any camshaft in it? Does the motor have any camshaft in it? Or is it just... Well, you know, a little bit. A little bit, but not a lot. Yeah, I'd have to ask Ed Smith. I think he did actually, but not a lot. And the only reason I'm asking is because there's a lot of drop between neutral and yeah, drive, which that. usually that. signifies that the torque converter isn't very well matched to the motor. That's kind of why I'm asking. That. Okay. Um, I mean, you got five, six hundred RPM drop. Usually, I want to see two to three hundred yeah, RPM drop. Yeah, too much. Quite a bit. Yeah. So, does that mean that potentially we need to redo the tranny, or I would question. The torque converter that's in, I would want to know more about the torque converter okay. because there's such a huge drop in RPM. Yeah, it should be. And it's a torque. It, it, think about your car at home: 800 RPM in neutral, 600 RPM in drive. Yeah. We're 11, 1200 down to about 500. Yeah, now. it's a big drop, a lot of drop. I would kind of wonder about that. Okay, is that <coughs> something we can just live with, or should we dig into it <coughs> and and fix it? 
rest of your mind. It would be more drivable if it had a two to 300 RPM okay. drop from right. park to drive. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we had a real wind problem outside doing a little wrap up here. And JB is trying to give a great shout out to Chuck's and how well we were treated and what professionalism and expertise is available there. I'm unfortunately having to wrap it up for JB on this one. And thank you for watching and subscribing and liking our videos. We very much appreciate all of you. Otherwise it dries up, it turns hard, and what in the name of all it's holy? Oh, you can press that off button right there to the right, all the way to the right. Press that, the button part. Oh, the, the button. button. Just hold it in for a little bit. Oh, hold it in. There you go. Ah, where were we? Let's start over. Okay. That's going to kill it.